So the talk that I'm going to give today uh, I've called multi-scale dynamics from molecules to cells. And um, it's really hopefully going to introduce you to some of the more uh, cutting edge work that we're doing to try to sort of bridge um, biological length scales in terms of space and time uh, with in silico approaches. Okay, so um, I think this probably does not come as a surprise to anyone in the audience, but uh, computing is really transforming chemical research and actually not just chemical research, but research in general. Um, so what I'm showing here just to sort of build the excitement from the computing standpoint is um, a plot that shows the available computing time, uh, at least on the, the supercomputers in the United, that are available for research in the United States as a function of time. And um, so what you can see is that, you know, in the early 90s, the first supercomputer came online and had about a dozen CPUs. And with that system, using the approaches that I'm going to tell you about today, or some of the approaches I'm going to tell you about today, they were able to study uh, systems on the size of a single protein um, that had maybe about 10,000 atoms. And in terms of biological simulation, we were able to sample time scales on the order of hundreds of picoseconds. So that's fairly short. And what we've seen is that every four to five years since then, we've increased our available computing power by about an order of magnitude on these, uh, on these machines. And so it brings us up through uh, today um, where we have um, actually a handful of machines that have um, uh, nearly a million cores or um, maybe fewer cores, but also that have GPU accelerated uh, capabilities. And so with these newer machines, we're able to simulate much larger systems. So we've gone from a single protein scale system to looking at an entire envelope virus, which is actually what I'm going to talk to you about today towards the end of the talk. And we've gone from maybe being able to simulate about 10,000 atoms to actually being able to track multiple hundreds of millions of atoms over time scales um, on, the, on the order of hundreds of microseconds. And so in addition to just, um, and most of these are CPU computing, but in addition to these big um, uh, supercomputers, we also have really enjoyed uh, the recent developments with GPU or graphical processing unit technology, uh, which has basically brought supercomputing to the desktop thanks to um, terrific advances in the algorithms and the MD codes. And then, of course, well, I think probably many of you know, um, in the U.S., they launched last year, I believe, uh, this National Strategic Computing Initiative of the NSCI, which is supposed to uh, sort of be the, the planning body and the governing body that's going to hopefully bring to fruition exascale computing. So these leadership class computing machines that I sort of uh, indicated at the end of this plot, Mira and Titan, also NCSA Blue Waters, which I'll show here. This is a sustained petascale machine. Um, it's very difficult to get access to. Some of the work I'll tell you about actually we're running on that machine, um, but sort of like the, the NCSI is actually going to be around envisioning what is the next step for computing? How is that going to take place? Okay, so in addition to the computing, we are really excited about the data revolution that's happening in biology. And so this is from a number of different sources. I think one of the most exciting sources are um, what's coming along with electron microscopy and tomography, where thanks to advances in things like these um, direct detectors, they're able to now resolve and visualize um, near atomic structure for supermolecular complexes and, um, and really get a finer appreciation, a better appreciation for the finer details of cellular ultrastructure. And so um, what I'm showing sort of the sort of blob that you see moving there um, is basically a vestibular hair cell, which helps you keep balance. This is um, uh, data that was taken um, at a resource here, also at UC San Diego called the National Center for Microscopy and Imaging Resource. And um, so you could just, that, that, that imaging data, we, we can develop methods to do reconstructions and so forth, segmentations and reconstructions. Um, another different kind of data that's very exciting is serial block electron microscopy. And this is really allows us to, um, to uh, basically embed a cellular structure or cell, a, a tissue or cell samples. So um, this allows us to basically do volume imaging in some sense of cells. And so on the top 
electron microscopy and tomography, we basically get sort of supermolecular assemblies and maybe have like one or two molecules in, in, in the sample. But with Surya Blackingham, we actually have maybe hundreds of thousands of molecules in there. And so one of the major challenges, so it's great that we have all this data, but of course there's a lot of challenges with, um, with uh, actually trying to use this data uh, in gainful ways. Um, not just for understanding structural biology, but also to try to connect this data to um, new advances in simulation science. And so um, in my resource, which uh, David sort of mentioned in the beginning, is National Biomedical Computation Resource, or what we call NBCR, we develop all sorts of technologies ranging from um, segmentation and refinement uh, algorithms through to um, what I'll show you next. Uh, it's actually sort of the simulation technologies. And so at MECR, what we're really trying to do is to develop new capabilities that span spatial scales in biology from uh, the molecular level, which you can see um, on the left, top left of the slide. Um, so this is, you know, we're talking about angstrom nanometers um, through the subcellular organization. Um, to try to understand how these sort of biological neighborhoods fit into cells and how these cells fit into the ecosystem like community of, of tissues. Um, and so uh, we're right, there's a sort of, there's a really vast range of spatial scales from the molecular to the tissue um, uh, and also time scales, right? So at the smaller scale level for space, typically it's also you worry about faster time scales. So we're talking about things like femto nanoseconds. Um, and then as you sort of go up the scale um, in, in space, you also typically are more concerned with different sorts of biological phenomena that are happening on longer time scales. And so we have, as biomedical researchers, we have um, capabilities within each of these scales. Pretty, we have pretty good capabilities within each of these scales, but where we're really lacking is at the interface of scales. And so how can we actually create new approaches that allow us to connect across these scales. So for example, we, how do we go from sort of the molecular dynamics of a single drug target to actually trying to understand how that drug target is situated inside its realistic subcellular compartment or neighborhood and, um, and so forth. So, and ultimately what we hope to do is really sort of make concrete connections between all of these scales so that we can um, understand the molecular mechanisms and, um, uh, uh, and and sort of chemical mechanisms that actually underlie underlie different kinds of diseases and, and different cell phenotypes. So we're trying to really so at NBCR we're trying to really work on those sort of technology gap areas that I'm, that I've highlighted there. Okay, and so as one um, example project to sort of like bring the technology that we're working on into context of some interesting biological science, um, I thought I would give a talk about uh, the flu, uh, which is something that we've been working on for some years. And I think most people, um, I'm sure all of you in the audience have, um, you're familiar with the flu, you've likely had several strains of it over the course of your life. And um, so probably many of you also remember in June of 2009, the, uh, the, the pandemic swine flu that, um, that sort of ripped through, uh, it really went very rapidly around the world. I think it was um, it went in three months it had effect, infected every, nearly every country on the globe. Um, and so what they saw with um, these pandemic, this pandemic strains was that, were that these first circulating strains um, were highly transmissible, so that's why it spread so rapidly, and they had moderate se severity or really sort of, um, sort of normal what we call pathogenicity. So, you know, if you got the flu, it was sort of, um, unless you were either pregnant or I think very young or very old, you pretty much, you were going to be fine. It was sort of going to be a normal case of the flu for you. Um, this is in contrast to H5N1, which is also known as bird flu or avian flu, which probably a lot of folks have also heard about. Um, and so what I'm showing here is a map of, um, of where they have found H5N1 in humans. So this is like human contracted cases spanning from 2003 to 2013. And so what's interesting about this is this is the flu that is being, it's, it's, it's an avian flu, so it's normally found in birds. And so um, it can be spread by these birds. 
Um, and there has been documented bird to mammal and bird to human transmission. But that, but actually catching this type of flu from the bird is very rare if you're a human. Um, so but the problem is, as you can see in this plot, is that if you do catch it, uh, that you have actually, you, you appear to have a pretty good chance of, uh, of actually dying from it. So you can see in these different cases, like in Indonesia, there was 192 documented cases and 160 deaths. So sort of like the worst case scenario would be that uh, you would have this highly pathogenic strain of the flu that would be also highly transmissible. And, um, you know, that could wreak havoc uh, for global health, obviously, similar to something like what happened in the 1918 Spanish influenza outbreak. And so um, what I'm going to talk to you about today basically um, deals with the structural biology and dynamics of influenza. And I'm going to talk to you about that at a few different scales from the molecule to whole virus simulations. And um, so just to remind everybody or, or um, so that you can learn about what these different components of the flu actually look like. If you look at the top, um, the top image of what I'm showing you, um, what you can see is the, of the host cell on the left hand side, and you can see how the viruses sort of can bud off of the host cell. And what happens is, um, if you look at the, the virion in the middle, um, the blue spikes on this virus uh, are what are called hemagglutinin. And those hemagglutinin molecules are actually what sort of latch onto these sugar groups or these, these glycans or carbohydrates that actually hang off from the host cells. Um, and so the sister glycoprotein, which is indicated in red in this image, is called neuraminidase. And neuraminidase is actually, um, it's, it's the molecule that actually performs the cleavage, as you can sort of see it there, uh, the cleavage of the terminal sialic acid on the sugar groups that are hanging off the host cell. So as influenza is sort of coming off the host cell, um, the, the, the hemagglutinins are sort of hanging onto it and the neuraminidases clip that linkage off and allow the virus to, um, to basically fully bud off and release, and then you have continued viral replication. And so um, on the bottom panel, what is sort of indicated there is um, a little bit about how we can treat the flu. So of course we have things like uh, vaccines, which are great. Um, and they're of course wonderful prophylactic uh, treatments most of the time, um, if, if they get the restraint right. Um, but uh, of course, once you have it, one way to, tr once you actually have the flu, one way that you can actually treat it is with something called neuraminidase inhibitors. So those, those are those objects that are indicated by those sort of like half moon, red half moon shapes. And what happens there is that the drugs actually bind inside the active site of neuraminidase and basically prevent the ability of that protein to cleave, to perform that final cleavage. So the virus actually just gets sort of like stalled, being stuck to the host cell. Or you have, and then you have halted viral replication. Okay, so a lot of people, for all the reasons that I told you about, because it is so important for global health, um, have been studying, of course, flu transmissibility and pathogenicity for a long time. And probably something that you may also have heard about had to do with some fairly controversial work that was done in 2012. Um, actually, I think it was done uh, significantly before that, but it was published in 2012. Um, so this was where they actually, there were two labs um, uh, who uh, created uh, these strains of the flu that had mixed, um, resorted strains of the flu that had mixes of H5 and H1N1. And basically what they saw is that, um, uh, that uh, if they mixed the, the viral components in a certain way, that um, uh, they could sort of explore questions in transmissibility. So the problem with this is that, um, you, uh, of course, nobody really wants anybody to make those strains that could be uh, you know, very deadly and very transmissible. And that is a, definitely a, a public health sort of nightmare because what we have seen in many cases is that even if somebody doesn't intend to use it as vital warfare, um, these mistakes can happen and it's, it's actually uh, not unheard of to see these type of viruses actually escape even the most um, sort of tightly controlled uh, laboratories. So they actually, um, once these papers came out, there was a whole bunch of press about it and then they actually um, 
uh, put a moratorium on this type of research for quite some time. Um, uh, eventually they did, some months later, they did actually open it back up, but they actually in the process created something, um, they created a, a National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity sort of working group to investigate um, and to sort of sort of map up a landscape for what studies would actually be safe for experimentalists to pursue. And so these, these sort of dangerous studies are what are called, they're also called gain of function studies because they, um, these researchers essentially would be sort of introducing function into um, a background of other function or non-function and that could give it some sort of features that could be very bad. So what, it, what I'm showing in the um, in the sort of large green bubble, this is sort of like all the gain of function studies, which really only a subset of gain of function studies that are banned or that come under significant scrutiny because of, you know, really drastic public health or biosafety concerns. And um, sort of my thought on that is that this is exactly where computation can play a key role, where if we had models that were predictive and reliable, um, we should be able to create all sorts of different models in silico um, and actually hopefully then they never actually have to make these um, experimentally um, and in any case so this is sort of like along the lines of where where this talk is, is going so um, as I sort as I alluded to in the first slide um, we are using uh, molecular dynamic simulations as what I like to refer to as a computational microscope and so the idea is that um, X-ray crystallographers or these electron microscopists and tomographers, they basically can image um, either protein or subcellular or cellular structure, but in a static way. Okay, and so what we can do is actually what we're trying to do is use different computational approaches to basically reanimate these static representations of the biological components and then actually learn something about them to gain new insight. And so um, molecular dynamic simulations is one technique that has seen broad applicability um, across a number of different fields. And so it's pretty straightforward. Um, but basically you can see it, it's sort of, um, we represent all the atoms in our system basically like hard spheres. So we're representing for protein, we're representing everything at the atomic level. And then we have a fairly simple potential function U, which is shown on this slide that has different terms that basically describe the physical motions of these systems. So we have um, every two atoms that are connected form a bond, three atoms form an angle, four atoms have a dihedral term, and then you have what we call the non-binding interactions, which would be um, like the van der Waals, so preventing collisions, um, as well as electrostatics. And then all we're doing is basically integrating Newton's equation of motion over time. And so what happens is we start with an initial configuration or structure that we get from the experiments. We integrate a time t, which is that delta t, that time step, that integration time step is very small. It's typically like a one or two femtoseconds. So we integrate that time step, we get another structure. We do that again, we get another structure. And so on and so forth. So we build up a dynamical evolution of the system over time. And so for the flu, one of the early findings, um, oh my gosh, from a decade ago, <laughs> I can't believe how fast time flies. So about 10 years ago, um, we were studying the neuraminidase enzyme, which is the cleaving enzyme that I was telling you about. So neuraminidase has actually been, um, it's basically the most reliable drug target that we have in the flu. Um, it does show some resistance mutations, but um, so far it's, it's not as bad as the M2 ion channel, which has developed a lot of resistance actually to the available inhibitors. So what we saw in, we ran a bunch of different molecular dynamic simulations of this protein, and we saw um, something very interesting that, so what you can see in, so you should be looking at, um, we're looking at the active site of neuraminidase, the green sort of blob uh, is the active, is, is what the shape of the protein looks like after we run some molecular dynamic simulations. So we call that an open snapshot. And then what I'd like you to compare it to is the pink image that you see that's sort of a wireframe image. Um, and down in this, in this region, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor. 
but um, there's something called the 150 loop where you see big differences in the crystal structure versus the structure from the dynamics. And so, and then what I'm also showing you is um, a drug molecule. This is Tamiflu, which probably many of you have heard of. This is the only orally available flu inhibitor that we have um, to treat the flu. Uh, it's actually bound in the active site of the molecule. So what our work showed was actually that this molecule is super flexible and it has, um, and, the, and the, this motion actually opens up this pocket and the pocket actually appears to be druggable. So um, we put that forth as a possibility as um, sort of a new structural understanding that could enable the development of drugs that actually would target particular strains. So um, then a number of different series of structural studies came out um, and they were very interested in the formation of the one, this 150 cavity. So where we saw that, that loop motion, that was something that was called the 150 cavity. Um, and um, when was this one? This must have been in 20, this must have been in about 2011. Um, what they found, they crystallized the neurodivase from the swine flu, and surprisingly, it was um, it was crystallized with a closed 150 loop and a closed cavity, where everybody was expecting that it was it should everybody was expecting to have an open cavity like they had seen with the other N1 strains. And so it turned out that this was the only group one neurodivase that had a closed crystal structure. So, of course, we were very curious about that too, and we um, had a number of simulations of that structure, and actually what we found was that the crystal structure was sort of an anomaly, that even though it was crystallized in close confirmation, we ran many microseconds of dynamics, and what we saw was that pretty quickly into letting it, into giving it some kinetic energy, um, basically this protein relaxed into the open confirmation. And um, so we actually predicted that the majority of uh, that this actually so they crystallized it in the open in the closed in the closed form in reality in vivo it's probably open most of the time and then we did a really sort of nice bioinformatics analysis with an evolutionary biologist um, named Robin Bush who's at UC Irvine and we actually discovered that this whole opening and closing uh, of the 150 loop is actually controlled by the presence of one key salt bridge and so. Um, this is sort of, it was nice to actually understand the mechanism of the structural arrangements, and we were only able to do that because of the computation. So, um, so we also study the HA at the single level and so forth, but where we really want to go um, is in trying to um, understand the structure and the biology and the dynamics of the virus more holistically. And so at NBCR, we've been working for some years to try to integrate this, all of the structural data that we have across different scales into one um, accurate, highly detailed, three-dimensional model of the flu. And so, um, so we, in collaboration with Elsner Stephen, who is um, a wonderful structural biologist at the National Institutes of Health, so what I'm showing you in the upper left are his cryo-electron tomography images of the flu viruses. And, um, from there, we can basically see where, using those images, we can basically see where all the different positions of the microproteins are on the surface of the virus. And then we've developed a number of different tools, um, like high molecule lipid reference cell pack. We've developed these tools as a resource to, um, that enable the reconstruction of the particle. And why we're doing this, why we're doing this we really want to understand molecular recognition um, across multiple scales. So again, so this is, so basically as we're, I'm going to walk you a little bit through the construction of this. Um, now in the upper right hand corner are, um, are the, the, the tomographic images of the flu particles. And basically we start by just outlining, so we have these points from an EM based model that basically align the, um, where the membrane is, the membrane surface of the virus by the surface. And then from the data, we can also, the spikes that you see, all the blue spikes are the positions of the hemoglobin glycoproteins. Again, we can get this from the, from the tomographic data. All the green spikes you see are the locations of the neuraminidase enzymes. And um, okay, so we have that from the tomographic scales. 
And then what we did was we took each of these molecular scale components. So the, the image, the protein on the far left, that's blue. It looks like he's actually dancing there. <laughs> it looks like his little legs on a dance floor. So what I'm showing is that's the hemoglobin and actually embedded in the liquid bilayer. And then we had, um, we ran multiple microsecond uh, length dynamic simulations of those. So we're starting with the crystal structure, but as you can see, we're like allowing the relaxation and motion to sort of get a better idea of what the actual biological dynamics look like. Um, and we did this to, um, to, to, to learn more about the dynamics of the proteins, but also to, to refine regions that we actually had to model that were not experimentally resolved. Okay, so the little bits that actually stick into the membrane of the glutamin is something that we actually had a homology model. And then the green molecules, which are the neuraminidase, um, that whole long stalk that it sits on, actually looking at it now, it kind of looks like a stalk of broccoli. <laughs> um, anyway, we actually had to homology model that stalk. And so um, we, uh, this work was recently published where we sort of talked about all the dynamics in it. So we took these snapshots from the dynamics that had some of the protein as well as a bit of the membrane, and we actually used those to position onto um, the uh, sort of the, the, the coarse grain or the, the sort of rough uh, image model that we had from the, from the cryo -EM. And so, so one of the other things that we had to do for this was, um, you know, most of the time in molecular simulation, what people are doing is they take a single protein and they embed the protein in, in a planar lipid bilayer. Um, but we actually know biologically that, you know, that's a sort of far cry from reality. So we actually developed a tool called lipid wrapper that basically can wrap fully atomic lipid bilayers around any geometry that you give it. And the, the, the composition of the bilayer can be whatever you specify, basically. So um, this was sort of, uh, this was a necessary approach to actually create atomic lipid bilayers at that scale. Um, and then so, um, so this is sort of just a timeline of, of the study overall. So we actually started working on this in 2012. Um, in yeah, late 2012, we started working on different tools to actually build the system. And then um, what we really wanted to do was actually get this simulation up and running. So to run the uh, molecular dynamic simulation of the whole virus. And so um, the virus, when completely constructed, has about 180 million atoms, including explicit solvent. Um, and I didn't give you any dimensions there, but sort of it's, it's roughly about 100 to 120 nanometers in diameter. So it's pretty big for all atom biophysical simulations. It's actually the largest simulation that we know of for, bio, for biophysics. So um, it took us about a year to build the system, and then we waited to try to get computing time. And uh, um, we actually, it was actually funny reading the reviews from, from the reviewers because people basically didn't think it was gonna work. Um, and they were very, very hesitant to give us any time at all. Um, we were actually not successful the first two times we applied. And then finally, um, a program officer at the NSF said, listen, Romy, we're going to give you time to do this. So they gave us a little bit of time. And we did actually get up and running on, um, we ended up running on about 115,000 processors. And this is using the NAMD2 molecular dynamics engine. So this actually scaled very well to about 300,000 processors on Blue Waters. And this is, um, this uses this is really like parallelized computing. This is not anything that you can really do without such a large scale computer. It uses MPI um, to do the communication. And um, anyway, so you can sort of see here, we, we were able to gather about 120 nanoseconds of data, um, which was about, um, in terms of the biological time scales, which was about, it was about 15, 12 terabytes, 12 terabytes of data. And so one of the interesting things, um, although it's been, sort of fun and exciting to build systems at scales that are in some sense unprecedented. Um, you also really quickly realize that it breaks every single tool that you have <laughs> to work with. So along the way, we've had to develop all these tools, not just for system building, but also for system visualization and analysis. One of those tools that we're still working on at NBCR is called CellView. 
So this allows us to do real-time interactive visualization and exploration of highly complex biological models. And so the image I'm showing you here, this is not influenza, this is actually HIV in, in blood plasma. Um, but it's this, um, this pretty neat sort of like multi-scale interaction uh, visualization platform and it runs just on your desktop, um, which uh, is, is great. The virus is rotating and also you can see all the molecules actually well, you can kind of see it wiggling and jiggling and those wiggling and jiggling those are actually that's the atomic motion as predicted from the molecular dynamic simulations and so this is the data actually sort of visualized and interacted with in real time um, using cell view and so this was again so this is running um, this 160 million atom system using the NAMD molecular dynamics engine on blue waters okay so you have all this data and now what are you going to do with it um, so it turns out if you actually just look at the structural dynamics of the entire virus, it doesn't look like much is happening. <laughs> so um, the first frame of the simulation I'm, I'm showing in solid representation, and it's overlapped with the last frame of the simulation, which is in sort of this glowing mesh. And you can see it's, you know, the things have shifted a little bit, but it looks pretty much the same. Um, but what's interesting is when you actually start to look at the finer scale detail of the atomic motion for the different glycoproteins. And um, what we see here is actually that these large scale simulations, so this is um, looking at the, the top two principal components, um, uh, sort of against, plotted against each other for um, nerminidase on the bottom and the hemagglutinin system on the top comparing simulations from just single, comparing just single glycoprotein simulations um, to what we sample on the virus. And we can see that we have much more sampling on the virus. And that's just by virtue of the fact that we have so many copies of each of these types of molecules on the surface of, of the virus. And so the other um, thing that's actually sort of neat about these models is it allows you to study multiple components at the same time. So with one system set up, you actually get, you know, you're going to get information about each of the glycoproteins um, in the, you know, in the system. Um, and so hidden inside the, the, the viral membrane, which I didn't talk about, are these M2 ion channels, um, which have been some drug targets for some long time. And so um, what I'm showing on the right are sort of some different snapshots that we captured the M2 ion channel in. We actually saw an opening to closing transition or several transitions. Um, which is interesting and then we have um, we can sort of uh, we have a tool to actually develop uh, sort of analyze the the pocket shape and the pocket volume and so in the panel a you can see that channel is open compared to channel c you can see that it's it's actually closed and we can look at the volume of distributions that are sampled the other really cool thing about these big simulations which i hadn't thought about until um sort of more recently was that because we have so many copies of each of these proteins we can actually use something called markov state modeling to actually look at um what, what markov state modeling allows you to do is basically um, stitch together all of these short time scale simulations that we have for for each of these neuraminidases actually um, into one model that allows us to essentially extract long time scale dynamics from many, many short time scale simulations. And so for the first time, we actually now have predictions about the actual rates of loop opening and closing for neuraminidase, which is, I think, very, it's, it's pretty cool. And um, we can also look at rates of other um, parts of the motions of different uh, glycoproteins. And then I guess the last part here, I have like two minutes. Um, what we really want to do, though, as I sort of mentioned, is try to use these, this, this highly detailed physical model and simulations in order to sort of make a virtual lab for the flu. And um, so what we did actually was we uh, constructed four different viruses, um, four different viral strains, so we have the, um, which are sort of shown, which are shown here in this table. We have the uh, California 09 um, wild type, that's the swine flu strain. We have the avian influenza strain from Vietnam in 2004. We have a strain from um, a, a study by Blumenkrantz. And we also have what we call a potentially catastrophic gain of function or scary strain, which actually has um, different, it has the mix, 
that we that people predict would be um, both highly transmissible and uh, very virulent. Okay, and so what we're talking about here is um, we have these structural models that have the viral envelope with all the different glycoproteins, but we've now swapped in and out different components to actually create these strains in silico. And then what, we do, what we've done is actually, instead of running molecular dynamics, we actually can use something called Brownian dynamics, and we're using a program called Brown Dye that's also developed at the center. Brownian dynamics basically models the rigid body diffusion of um, an association of, of, of different molecules. And so we basically have the virus and a, recep a, sort of a, a receptor analog to basically see where drugs and, and substrates actually will want to bind on the surface of, of the flu. And what we find actually, um, and this is unpublished still, actually most of the, all of the full viral work is still unpublished. Um, so this is uh, sort of very hot off the press. Um, what we find is actually that there is um, a tip in the balance between the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase uh, kinetic, binding kinetics that may be actually linked to pathogenicity uh, in the flu. So, um, you know, we're doing more analysis, but we're pretty excited about that. So, you know, where do we want to go with this? Well, we'd like to actually develop, or we are actually in the process of looking to see now that we have this full, these full models developed, we can actually do things like try to look at where these, where different antibodies bind. And um, in particular, there's someone down here in San Diego uh, who um, has, um, has, has discovered this super antibody site on, or this broadly neutralizing site on the stem portion of the hemagglutinin. So normally the antibodies for the flu bind on the head of the hemagglutinin as, show, as shown in this image. So the black molecules on top of the green molecule, those are the black molecules are the antibodies. Um, there's this side site um, on this that's circled in red that actually could be something where you could develop a vaccine against that site and it would it would work against all strains of the flu, which would be the ideal thing. Um, and so we're looking, we're doing a number of different studies to try to understand access to that site and sort of what drives binding and molecular recognition. And so, um, you know, so like ultimately where we want to go is in trying to extend molecular structure to cellular environments. And um, part of that, you know, as I sort of discussed along the way, is sort of the, is the need to generate new tools that allow us to create these highly detailed models. Another tool that we um, are developing is something called CellPack, which basically takes data, well, it takes all different kinds of data, but for example, what you could do, or what we've done is actually taken data from, again, electron tomography and microscopy, and those sort of like big blob, so you can, diff, you can use that data, which sometimes just looks like blob data, but it actually gives you a sense of like the structure of these different cellular compartments. You can basically use that data to define um, like surface containers, and then if you know the different molecular ingredients, with high resolution. So uh, for example, the crystal structures of ATPase and whatever else that are, and proteases and whatever else are components of your model, then you can use CellPack to develop <clears throat> highly detailed mesoscale molecular level model. And so it will actually um, pack, given the stoichiometry that you input or a recipe of the different molecular ingredients, it actually will pack and, um, and form uh, a different model. A, a structural model for you. And it can actually do this in high throughput, um, which is cool. So this is sort of, this is a cell pack, an image of what we've done using cell pack for the flu, where we've now gone beyond just looking at the outer envelope, like I showed you before with the MD. So I didn't say this explicitly, but with those first simulations, we actually just have the membrane and the glycoprotein, and the virus is basically filled with water what we're doing and but that's it turns out to be an okay approximation because actually all the questions that we're asking involve the outside below you know the sort of the outer region of the of the virion so what's happening in the middle it's it, it's definitely not affecting what's going on but what we have now are actually you know working towards developing sort of like fully realistic models um, that we can you know continue to use to develop and explore um, questions in the flu and other diseases. Okay, and so hopefully I haven't gone too much past my time. 
Um, so just a quick acknowledgement, I have a terrific lab here in UC San Diego, and um, I have to say the two heroes of this work, one is a post, a former postdoc, Jacob Durant. He is now um, a faculty at the University of Pittsburgh. He's just started, and I'm um, sure he's going to take over the world. And then another super postdoc, or super graduate student, Lane Vitopka, who um, is now actually um, doing a postdoc also with Ken Dill. So, um, and of course NIH for funding and the NSF for computing time and I would like to thank all of you for your attention and I would be really happy to take any questions that you may have.